Good afternoon, folks. Welcome. Welcome to Little River State Park. On behalf of Vermont State Parks, Michael Snyder, Commissioner of Forest Parks and Recreation, Director of State Parks, Craig Whipple, Secretary Julie Moore. Uh, we're really thrilled to have the governor uh, having his weekly press conference here to help us kick off the kind of the unofficial beginning of summer and our serious beginning of our, our, our camping season at Vermont State Parks. More on that uh, shortly. But with that, I'll introduce Governor Scott. Welcome, Governor. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good afternoon, everyone. Great to see you here at Little River State Park. I have fond memories of camping here years ago. Well, it may not feel like it. Uh, Memorial Day weekend, which we just celebrated, uh, marks the unofficial start of summer. This means the start to uh, the start to welcoming folks to our state parks, which for the most part are in full swing for the summer, including a huge network of multi-use trails. And we have high hopes for another successful year. The outdoor recreation uh, is, uh, is a major contributor to our $2.8 billion tourism economy, and a primary reason why 13 million people visit the state each year, why young professionals relocate to Vermont, and why Vermonters choose to remain in the state. Last year, we saw over 1 million visits to our parks. This was an impressive 45% increase from the last, uh, over the last 10 years. I think people are realizing how important it is to get outdoors with friends and family. And our great selection of state parks is an easy way to do it. We're seeing a similar uptick at popular trailheads in both state and municipal forests. With increased use, there's more urgency to make sure our infrastructure is in good repair. It meets the needs of the park and trail visitors, many of them Vermonters. That's why we're making improvements to some of our busier trail networks. For the last several years, we focus on increasing capital construction dollars for our parks infrastructure, which is important because uh, many of these were originally built between 1930 and 1960. Modernizing is important even in the world of camping. Recent construction of small cabins in our campgrounds is a prime example. Traditional camping is still strong, although there's an, also an interest in having a little more creature comfort. Um, instead of sleeping on the ground in tents, uh, a growing number of people prefer our rustic cabins with beds, chairs, tables, four walls, and a roof. When I was, uh, when I was a kid, my dad decided he wanted to take up camping, take the family out camping. And uh, as uh, some of you know, my dad was a double amputee uh, as a result of World War II. Uh, but he decided uh, he was pretty independent, and we had a station wagon at the time, and I remember him buying a, a tent that fit on the back of the station wagon uh, that would uh, over, over, uh, overlook the, the back of the, the station wagon. Uh, but then we'd have to sleep on the ground. Uh, and that lasted about one weekend. And he said that uh, he had done enough camping on the ground in the service. So he, uh, we went and bought a uh, pop-up camper at that point. Uh, so uh, we spent the summer, the summer doing that. Unfortunately, he passed away uh, the next year. But back to our state parks. I think you would have appreciated uh, the, uh, the uh, camp uh, uh, creature comfort of today. So back to our state parks. These, uh, these cabins we offer now have an occupancy rate of 85 to 90 percent, compared with a 40 percent system-wide. Interest continues to grow, showing there's a clear demand for more. So I'm pleased to have worked with the team here and with the support of the legislature to fund an effort that will build at least 20 more cabins, increasing the total inventory from 45 to 65. And here's what I really love about this initiative. In addition to increasing our capacity uh, for overnight visitors, these simple structures are an excellent training project for those learning technical skills in carpentry, excavation, and electrical. As many of you know, uh, tech schools are important to me uh, because I'm a product of them. So I've asked our Forest, Forest Parks and Recreation Department to work with career and technical centers across the state and have students build these valuable and useful structures. This way, it becomes a project to build important tourism infrastructure while at the same time teaching useful practical skills to our young people. Skills that can help them prepare for well-paying, meaningful jobs in Vermont. The truth is, we need more of our youth involved in the trades. As the average age of a construction worker is about 56. So this is a great way to achieve multiple goals we have as a state. 
This is just one of the uh, many initiatives uh, our Parks Department is working on to encourage camping and outdoor recreation. So I'll now turn it back over, I think, to Commissioner Snyder uh, to share more on some of our summer programs. Yes, sir. Thanks, Governor. And thank you for your support of Mont State Parks and the Rustic Cabin program. Uh, being fairly modest, this was the Governor's idea and we were thrilled at it. The idea of an increased investment through our capital program to work with the tech center schools uh, and students to build cabins just like this in response to this growing and changing demand. Um, and thank you again for helping us kick off the season, Governor. And I would just quickly, briefly, there's a lot we could say. I think you know, um, actually Vermont is, an, is a nationwide leader in uh, uh, outdoor recreation as a driver of economic development. Uh, the governor has, has been a leader in this in establishing VOREC, the Vermont Outdoor Recreation Economic Collaborative, uh, with uh, non-government partners around the state, for-profit, non-profits, and it's, it's been very exciting. And it's led to, uh, in addition to the traditional things we do in state parks, like the um, Venture Vermont or statewide scavenger hunt, very popular for families and uh, Vermonters and visitors alike. Check out the Parks Pass program. Libraries throughout the state have a you can check out a Parks Pass just like checking out a book to come to uh, the parks. Uh, we have the Parks Prescription Program where we work with medical providers to literally write prescriptions to children who might need a little less screen time, a little more outdoor time to have a Parks Pass as a prescription to get out. Uh, and on and on it goes. Through VORAC we've initiated uh, and partners at the Outdoor Gear Exchange more recently our first time Happy Campers Program which is helping folks who might have an interest in coming to a park and doing some overnight camping but have a barrier, they don't have the equipment, they don't have the know-how. With uh, generous donations from uh, Outdoor Gear Exchange and their manufacturers and, and suppliers, providing camping gear for first-time campers. And then our wonderful park staff helping them, welcoming them, helping them get set up, understand how to use the equipment, and how to orient to the park. Um, we have, uh, you know, this, this range of opportunities in state parks, and I would just close by saying, we see the parks uh, as kind of gateways to so much more in the outdoors. And when people get outside, we see tremendous economic benefit. As the governor said, over a million visitors to state parks last year and uh, nearly $90 million of related spending to, to parks visitation for our economy. Uh, there's local economic development, there's health and wellness benefits, family togetherness, and an environmental connectedness. That's a powerful package. And the parks are one avenue to that. Uh, and we continue to do the other things, expanding our trail networks for mountain biking, hiking, backcountry skiing, doing that with statewide partners like our member-based trail organizations throughout the state. Uh, and right here at Little River State Park, some world-class single-track mountain biking been in, uh, that we've increased in the last several years. You drove by, a new parking lot going in. That's all part of stewarding our recreational assets and growing them for, for and leveraging them for even greater economic development and, and wellness. So we're really proud of it. Proud that the governor would appreciate your support nice for that. And, um, uh, and other duties as a son, right? Yeah. <laughs> Keeping litter out of our parks. So with that, we're here to take, and I would rely on Craig, who's, uh, who's uh, a master of uh, guiding our staff in the state parks. Uh, they're very successful. We're extremely proud of that. Uh, Craig's here to help answer wh whatever questions you might have. I understand there might be a couple other things on your mind as well. <laughs> but uh, with that, I'll, I'll step back, and we'll open it up to questions. Thank you. Craig's only been here for, what, uh, three or four decades? A few days, yeah. <laughs> Are the new cabins going to be across all parks statewide? We haven't, Craig. We haven't um, uh, decided where they're going to go. We're working with the tech centers now. It, so depending on the interest of the tech center, the, 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 the cool part of this program is that we've got parks all over the place, and you've got tech centers all over the place. So we're hoping to scatter it around and spread it to whichever tech center this fits into. Because I think there's, there seems to be a whole lot of interest from the tech centers, but some of them already have class projects in the, in the, in the queue, and this wouldn't fit. So we're just kind of working out those details. So uh, we, we hope to spread them all over the place. What are, what are the amenities like in these cabins for people who might come to the parks and get a bare bones campsite where they pitch a tent and have a fire pit? What are these like? It's a long ways from that. Um, uh, we, you can come in here in a minute and, and take a look at it, but there's a futon to sleep on, there's some bunk beds, there's a table and chairs, electricity, um, uh, windows to close, uh, window screens, um, and there's a, a picnic table and a, and a, and a fire uh, ring. So you, you, you cook, 
and you, you, you spend time outdoors like all the rest of the people in the campground, uh, but you have this shelter to be in. And there's no plumbing in these, so the, the, you use the showers and the other restroom facilities like all the other people in the campground. And we put them on existing campsites, so we haven't really increased the number of campsites um, in most cases, but we've just, we've just upgraded certain tent, uh, otherwise tent sites to put cabin on. Generally speaking, what do they cost to stay in for a night, and how much do they actually cost to build one of these things? When we build them with a contractor, it's generally averaging about forty thousand dollars a piece. Um, building all, all in, everything, yeah. Uh, building with a tech center, we're not sure um, uh, how those the, the costs are going to work out for that. Uh, to rent them, it, it costs you uh, fifty-three bucks a night, mostly. Um, uh, if you're a Vermonter, we charge you fifty-one dollars a night. Thank you. You want them? Um, uh, there are a few around the set that we, we set prices. Um, uh, uh, there are some variable pricing around in Burton Island, you're going to pay more. Uh, some other places, they're a little bit higher. Across the board, mostly. Uh, you, you talked about the uh, prescriptions for park passes. This has been in place since the last administration. Do you know how many? Of these prescriptions are being written on an annual basis? Uh, we have, um, this is in partnership with the Governor's Council on Physical Fitness and Sports. Mm -hmm. um, we've been doing it with them for about four seasons now. Uh, we print um, 12,000 of these things in little pads like that. Um, the doctor puts the patient's name, age, signs it, and dates it, and, and they take this to Parkinson's free admission. Mm -hmm. um, we issue about 12,000 of those to 140 or so doctors across the state. Last year, there were 750 that got actually redeemed at the state park. And our partners um, and, and, and we get together and sort of debrief this, and some of us tend to freak out, like, oh, well, only 750. But the other way to look at it is uh, 12,000 times a doctor has said, this is good for you, get outside. And that's why we do this. It's, 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 a, it's, a, it's a way to, to, to present that message um, coming from somebody with the, the your health interests in mind. Yeah. And will the prescription get you any discount on the cabin price? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> it's just for, just for day entry. <laughs> Do you have a projected opening for some of the flooded parks uh, like Sandbar? Um, uh, I can tell you that Sandbar is opening very soon. We're kind of playing it day by day. Um, Albert Dunes, we have two things going on there. One is high water levels, and the other is construction of a brand new parking area, um, bathhouse. So we're trying to get both of those done and looking at an opening date of June 14th. Maybe folks should know that the reason for those delayed openings in the lake parks is high water and, and uh, interfering with infrastructure and, and operating and, and just enjoyment. So uh, it's unplanned and it happens. Our, I would give a shout out to our, our folks in the Northwest region in particular, really on their toes and uh, doing their best to get these things open and up and running. Uh, Green, Green Mountain Power is currently doing work here both at Little River and over, also over at the Waterbury Reservoir as part of their renewal of their permit to generate hydro. Um, is there similar work being done at other, other parks um, by Green, Green Mountain Power or, or some, some other ent entities such as that? Well, you're right, it's related to their relicensing, and uh, we're thrilled to have that partnership. And it, there's several projects all around the reservoir. You saw at the big dam here, a new boat launch. That's, that's one across, another boat launch across the way in Waterbury. Um, and it's, it's really restricted to this, this area here related to the, the Green Mountain Power Dam here. So, so, is, so I mean, is there, are there other work being done at other parks that are also conditional upon permits or any, any, anything like that? We have a lot of work going on all sure. over. Okay. We, we try to keep most of that kind of construction work uh, in the uh, off season, like the non camping season, not to interfere. But I think this is probably the only one related to uh, a dam relicensing that I know of. Governor Scott, someone else mentioned high water and uh, flooding impacts. You today, um, your administration completed uh, work of the preliminary uh, assessment that you forwarded on to FEMA. Uh, a significant step for those affected communities? Well, sure. If we can, uh, if we receive the money, uh, obviously it's in great need. Uh, as you might recall, we toured some of the uh, the damage uh, down in the, the Windsor County area, Bethel area in particular. And um, they have a lot of damage that needs to be repaired, a lot of expense, um, and obviously they're moving forward. But uh, 
but we're trying to do all we can and to make sure that we secure the funding. You fully expect that we'll receive it? I, you know, we far exceeded the threshold. Uh, I believe that uh, we we will receive the funding, but you know, you, you never know in, the, in this day and age. Uh, we're just uh, doing what we can, but I have uh, I have confidence. There are going to be a number of uh, unhappy people outside the Hilton tonight uh, where you're going to meet Governor Walker. Can you reiterate why you felt that you belonged there and uh, what statement you'd like to make to the union and the pro-choice folks who were not happy? Yeah, obviously. Uh, I want to make sure uh, that we uh, provide for the safety of those who, who disagree with us and, and they, uh, we protect that right. Um, but, uh, but this is an event that I go to every year, and, and I didn't invite the speaker, uh, but, uh, but I felt an obligation to make sure that we welcome uh, Governor Walker here uh, to our state. I got to know him uh, just a little bit uh, when I was in the, uh, at the National Governors Association meetings, and, uh, and again, we don't align uh, politically, uh, but, uh, but I thought it was an opportunity uh, to, uh, to just say thanks for coming, and I uh, hope he comes back. Is there something you hope to hear from him tonight or something you would like to tell him tonight? Well, maybe he has a lesson uh, lesson learned in some respects. He lost his last election. He was a two-term governor in Wisconsin. And uh, maybe he'll have some, some, uh, some thoughts uh, about what he went through and what maybe he did, uh, could have done differently. I, I just don't know. I, I've never, I haven't really heard him speak, uh, but I think it's an interesting story to hear. So if you and he are, are not politically aligned, and the, given the state of the Vermont Republican Party and it, it's the results of the last couple of elections, is this a, a good type of national Republican to invite here that's going to help propel you to greater things? Yeah, well, again, I, I think that there's a, a number uh, of Republicans uh, throughout our country uh, that would be ideal uh, for, for us to hear from. but. Uh, but I didn't have any uh, opportunity to weigh in on that. And, and again, uh, I think he has an interesting story to tell. Would he be on your list? Um, he wouldn't, uh, no. I, I, to be quite honest, I, I think that there are other, uh, others throughout the country that would be interesting to hear from, I, I believe. Uh, so, but, you know, it's not my call, and uh, we'll see what happens in the future. Well, what would you say to the pro-choice and union folks uh, who are going to be outside who might associate you with him? Well, I think Vermonters know me. Um, you know, I'm pro-choice. Uh, I always have been as well. Uh, you know, I've had, uh, we've had our, our, our share of uh, disagreements with the union, but there have been times when uh, when we work together, uh, look at the, with the NEA uh, this year, uh, we we uh, had a joint press uh, conference with them, uh, with an initiative. Uh, so we're, you know, Vermonters know me. I'm a centrist. I'm open-minded and uh, always willing to listen to other points of view. And I think that that's that should be the message here, uh, that we should be we see ourselves as being so tolerant, so compassionate. Uh, we, we should practice that, and we should listen to others, and, and I think this is an opportunity to do so. Didn't you just uh, a few weeks ago, though, decline to attend an event with a very conservative Republican activist woman? I chose not to go. I chose not to go uh, to that event. It wasn't uh, some. They didn't, I wasn't really invited, uh, so to speak. Uh, this is an event that I go to on a yearly basis. You, you've uh, suggested the direction that the party leadership, the GOP party leadership in Vermont has taken is maybe a little too conservative, that maybe there needs to be a change in who's leading the party. Um, do you feel like you're, uh, you're changing your mind here? Is this, um, do you still feel that way? Or do you still feel that the, the party is taking too conservative a direction? Well, the party had an election. Uh, they chose who they wanted to, to lead uh, the organization. Uh, I had an opportunity to uh, to put a candidate forward, and, and we didn't weren't successful, uh, but it's uh, it's what the majority uh, wanted at the time, so I respect that. Um, but I'm still uh, going to uh, move forward in the same fashion that I have for the last 20 years. I'm independently minded. Uh, I'm a centrist, and uh, and I'll call them as I see them. Can you give us any insight into some of the bills that you're planning to either veto or let go into law? By signing or by without signing? All of the above. Yeah. Um, I, uh, 
we continue to wait for bills. Uh, I signed a few more uh, today. Mm -hmm. uh, the uh, capital construction bill was mm -hmm. probably the largest mm -hmm. uh, couple in terms of uh, uh, judiciary uh, bills uh, mm -hmm. that uh, that I signed. Mm -hmm. uh, haven't vetoed anything yet. Can we expect it? <laughs> uh, you never know. Um, there there are a few that. Uh, I'm again trying to weigh in my mind. I'd like to see the bills and read them, uh, but we haven't received them yet. We're approaching uh, almost three weeks since they passed H57. Mm. Any insight as to why that has? Yeah, been interesting. Uh, haven't seen uh, seen that one uh, or the gun bill. Yeah. Uh, to be honest with yeah, you, that's been a while too. Yeah, that ha has not they been, haven't, has not arrived. Why they haven't sent no, I know. You know, it takes some time for them to go through. Uh, they want to make sure they're technically correct from their standpoint. And uh, mm -hmm. and then they've they've got a bit of a back backlog. I mean, there's a lot of bills that were passed at the end of the session, which normally happens. So it just takes a little time to get through them. No, no decision yet on the gun bill. No decision on the gun bill. What um, led you to make the decision that you let H57 uh, become law? Well, I I just felt as though uh, there was a lot of uh, pent up fear, and what I'm seeing across the country uh, led me to try and tone down that fear a bit uh, because I knew that uh, wasn't going to um, uh, veto the bill so I just thought I, it was it was appropriate for me to just come forward and, and say um, you know, if everything is technically correct that uh, the bill will go forward what about plastic bags um, same same with that uh, I haven't seen that one yet either um, but uh, it, you know it, as I've said before it seems as though um, there's been some agreement as to uh, that uh, initiative, and so if everything's technically correct, I would say that that would move forward as well. We've got uh, there's some money out there available, I guess, grant money for school safety upgrades. Um, I guess this is part two or phase two that you're in now. How is that going? Are you comfortable with? how schools are, are up, updating their security and security protocols? Well, I'm not sure that we, we can ever do enough, uh, but I think uh, when we, as you might recall, uh, over a year ago, uh, when we, um, when I passed and signed those bills, uh, there was money that was attached for safety improvements in schools, and uh, they went to work, and I was very proud of, of local law enforcement as well as the, uh, our public safety and, and state police. Uh, because they went throughout the state and uh, did an assessment as to what what the needs are in the individual schools, uh, so we put that uh, that money to work in a fairly short order, and and I thought that that was important to do, and we'll do the same here. And it's working. Thank you. It's it appears so. I mean, again, um, <clears throat> we've seen some threats since, and uh, we have to be vigilant and make sure that uh, if you see something, say something. And that was part of the campaign uh, as well with the NEA. You got to go by and take a look at the uh, four F 35s that happened to have paid an unexpected visit. Yeah, I was surprised to, to hear that they landed uh, in Burlington, but I, I think they're off limits. Uh, I haven't. Uh, I, you? Maybe. I don't, I don't know. You know this, these are Air Force, I believe. Uh, but uh, maybe they aren't. Maybe they're National Guard. Uh, they're out of. Uh, no. I, out of Utah, yeah, out of Hills. So I think it's Air Force. So uh, I'm not sure that uh, I haven't received an invitation. I haven't really had the time to do so. There was a lot of speculation at the end of the session about whether you would veto the minimum wage bill or the paid family leave bill, and I know that neither are obviously coming to you. But you, could you give folks some insight into where your where your thinking was? Uh, well, and it is on those two bills as, I, they, as again, you knew they stood at the end of the session. I think it's important for everyone to, to understand, first of all, I, I vetoed both of those uh, last session. Different versions. Different versions, but, uh, but last session. Uh, and uh, these were not my initiative. Uh, I believe this is a different approach uh, with minimum wage. I believe that we should be focusing on the economy, uh, that, that supply and demand uh, does come into play. Uh, and, uh, and I believe wages, uh, wages are rising. So uh, I think uh, this would have a detrimental effect on some of the rural parts of our state. And so I'm, uh, I was you know, obviously cautious about that. I want Vermonters to make more money. I mean, that's the bottom line. I think that's a, an area that we, uh, we agree uh, with, uh, or I agree with the, with the legislature on. It's just how we get there. Um, so uh, from that standpoint, <clears throat> um, just not my initiative. 
Uh, the uh, family leave, again, I think we both uh, agree that there should be a family leave plan of some sort. Uh, I was disappointed uh, that the voluntary uh, family leave did not pass. Uh, but we're only midway through. Uh, we have uh, the second half coming up uh, and nothing was put into play. So we'll continue to, uh, to advocate uh, for the voluntary family leave plan. I mean, with, with New Hampshire totally scuttling your side of it, because you have gone ahead and we had approved it just in Vermont? Yes, we could have, but, but I believe that theirs is still in play. They have another um, another month, I believe, in their legislative process. So they're still continuing to move forward with their, uh, the, the governor vetoed uh, paid family leave, but he's, uh, he's working with the legislature to forward his voluntary plan. It seems there's no question these will be back in January and they'll more than likely try to get them to you quickly. So do you think you'll be working with legislative leaders either over the summer and fall or in early January to come up with something that could be signed rather than having this speculative game of, well, maybe we'll pass this and maybe he'll sign it or not? I'll, always willing to talk, uh, as I said throughout the session. And, uh, and I, I would offer the same with our voluntary plan, uh, that always willing to talk over the summer about, about the attributes of that plan uh, and why I believe it's a good idea and a fir good first step and a way for us to try this out in a way that isn't going to be detrimental to the economy. And, and then we can test drive it and see how it goes. You say you're always willing to talk, but some of the legislative leaders expressed profound frustration that they couldn't draw you into a conversation about what you would and would not support and how to structure those two bills. Well, again, remember, those weren't my initiatives. I know. You know, so we start from not my initiatives uh, to, to an area where I made my points today mm -hmm. uh, quite known to them. So uh, I don't think it's fair to say that uh, I didn't weigh in. It's just not what they wanted to hear. First of all, and secondly, um, what I didn't tell them was whether I was going to veto it or not. Right. I tried that strategy uh, two years ago. They didn't like that when I told them what I wasn't going to do and what I was going to veto. So this is a different approach. Well, now that now that it doesn't matter, uh, would you have vetoed 12:20 an hour uh, and a hybrid uh, paid leave system? Well, we're just halfway through the season here, and uh, we're just at halftime. So um, I, I don't know if I would. Uh, divulge anything for the second half of the of the session here. Uh, just one other thing. 1% uh, increase in tuition at state colleges. And that's that's a, a victory? Well, zero uh, would have been a victory. Uh, but uh, but uh, the three million dollars that uh, I'd advocated for and put forward uh, would have taken care of that. Uh, they were shorted a bit uh, and uh, so they had to come up with a 1%. So, I think uh, it's reasonable. One percent uh, is uh, again a lot of money for some, uh, but uh, certainly uh, well uh, well within uh, the the the, um, the small increases that we're seeing across the uh, across the country. I think a lot of uh, colleges and universities are going up uh, substantially uh, higher than that. Will higher ed be a priority for you next year? It continues to be. Um, obviously, we. Uh, with uh, with projects like this, for instance, I, I just think that we need more in trades training, more higher education, uh, and more uh, the traditional four-year programs. And it's part of our economy as well here in Vermont. We're blessed to have some strong institutions, uh, the University of Vermont and Norwich University and Middlebury College and, and so forth, uh, St. Mike's. So um, we need to uh, do all we can uh, to continue with that, but also uh, trying to attract more people into the state and then find ways and opportunities uh, to keep them here. Is there anything about the budget bill that's heading to your desk that concerns you? Um, no, I mean, not in uh, totality. I think uh, they did a pretty good job. Uh, we started out a lot further apart, uh, but towards the end, uh, I believe that uh, we're well within within range. So I was so, pleased so with the results. Yeah, I mean, again, just want to make sure that everything's technically correct and there's no surprises in there. But uh, all in all, I think uh, I, don't, I don't see any uh, big issues with that. So are you a camper or a glamper? <laughs> <laughs> camper. Good answer. Don't believe it. <laughs> Uh, thank you very much for coming. Appreciate it. Stay. Uh, make sure you see 
the cabins. They are spectacular. I saw the first of them yeah. in uh, at uh, Burton, Island. Burton Island. That's right, and it was uh, pretty interesting. You gonna check this one out? Uh, yeah. While I'm right here, I'll take a look. <laughs>